back to your office, crack open a matrix textbook, maybe look up some of the eigenvalue properties. Wikipedia actually gives a summary of eigenvalue properties. Uh, they recap what they mean in their interpretation. And also go through the derivation and try to rederive it yourself. And, and which, which equation do I substitute in? But the key thing is don't just blindly say, okay, I want to meet the same object, the endpoint that Kevin got from the board. What you should be doing is look at each line and say, what does this mean? When you see T1 transpose T2, it means these score vectors are orthogonal. P1 transpose P2, orthogonal. P1 transpose P1 means it's unit length. Don't just write out the equations. That's too easy. Like, you just go ahead and substitute one into the other. Anyone can do that. It's very mechanical. But think about what, what you're doing and what the equations mean. In particular, think about what, what that uh, Lagrange function means. When you're setting k plus 1 equations in k plus 1 are nodes equal to 0, what does that mean? What, in, in English, what does it mean to set a whole group of equations equal to 0? Simple case. What do I mean when I say x1 plus x2 There's two equations and two unknowns set equal to zero. What, is, what does it mean geometrically to find the solution to that set of equations? The way those two lines intersect. We're doing exactly the same thing just k equations and k unknowns. Okay? You can actually draw that surface and it's not easy because it's obviously a k-dimensional space, but you could imagine then what, what the solution is asking you for there. So don't just blindly use the equations. Try to think what, through what they're meaning. Okay. At the end of the optimization approach, remember, okay, so we started out looking at the say, we say we're going to optimize. We want to maximize the variance of these constraints these are our search variables. But we ended up with an eigenvalue problem. Okay? We didn't we set out to do an optimization. We ended up with an eigen decomposition of H transpose X. And because it's a real symmetric matrix, we have a number of properties that we just covered at the end of the last section. We can always calculate it. We'll get these eigenvectors linearly independent. That's what Wikipedia will tell you. What that means then is that each component is orthogonal to the other. Okay, so linearly independent means that these vectors are orthogonal. Eigenvalues are real and non-negative, which is good because we show that the eigenvalue is equal to a variance. Wikipedia will tell you eigenvalues are real and non-negative. What does that mean? In this case, the eigenvalues are the variance. And that's why it's a good thing, because variances we know cannot be negative. So it's a good thing that real symmetric matrices give us non-negative eigenvalues. You'll get the progression of eigenvalues decreasing. We forced that, right? Because our objective function was find T1 transpose T1 that gives me the greatest variance. Then find me the next direction of greatest variance. If you've got lambda 2 bigger than lambda 1, it means that you didn't actually find the greatest direction of variance to begin with. Okay? So again, the good thing, the eigenvalues progress and get smaller and smaller because every subsequent component explains less and less variance. Sum of eigenvalues is equal to the total variance we start with in x, and then that's related to the r squared point. Now, I'll leave this for you to prove to yourself that if you start out with maximizing the variance explained, which is t1 transpose t1, t2 transpose t2, etc., that's exactly the same as minimizing the residuals. Okay? Very easy to prove you can do that in two lines. So when we're saying x is equal to tp transpose plus a residual, or in other words, x is equal to x hat plus a residual, I'm either trying to minimize that, means I will maximize that. So if I'm trying to minimize my errors, I'm going to maximize my variance explained in x hat, because that is constant. So I'm trading off either I'm going to put stuff into x hat or I'm going to leave it in the residuals. So whether I maximize one problem or minimize the other, I'm achieving the same goal. Okay?
this is a hand wavy kind of way to say you can prove this here mathematically or algebraically if those two objective functions are the same. Just a few other points here. Let's see. There's nothing here that we haven't really covered other than the key thing I want to point out on this slide and the next slide is we derive this for x transpose x. Okay? So if I've got a really long thin matrix, many observations, a few columns, okay, then x transpose x looks something like this. It's a k by k matrix. Okay? Very easy and, and efficient in that like to calculate the eigenvectors on a, such a small matrix. So let's say k is 5 or 6. I've only got a handful of measurements, but many, many observations. X transpose X gets me um, a covariance matrix. I can then go to MATLAB and say eigenvectors. Um, actually, that exact, let me just write it here for you. So for those of you that don't know MATLAB and want to try using it, uh, you can say something as follows. The eigenvectors, the eigenvalues equal to I X dash times X. So that will return the eigenvectors in another in one matrix, it will return the eigenvalues in another. But you will get here the loadings. Okay? Those are the loadings. Where are the scores? You don't get them. You have to, like Shafali says in that saying, to get the scores you have to then once you have the eigenvectors, then you say t is equal to x times p. So I've got my pa's. To recover my scores, I say t is equal to x times pa. Okay, then I've got my scores and my loadings. Then I can go, after that, I can go calculate x hat, because now I've got my scores, I've got my loadings. Once I've got x hat, I can then go calculate my residuals. e is equal to x minus x hat. Once I have my residuals, I can go calculate my r squared. My R squared requires the variance of the residuals in the numerator. I need the variance where what I started off with in the denominator that I can use again. So that's for really long, thin matrices. What if I have the case where I've got a short, fat matrix, or short, politically correct, wide matrix? <laughs> okay, so something like this. Now it's not so efficient to go calculate x transpose x anymore because I'm going to end up with something huge. Okay? X transpose x is going to be some crazy big matrix that I, I probably, depending on how big k is, I might not even be able to fit that into the RAM of my computer. Okay? So, and then even then, say I could, calculating the eigenvectors on that might lead to the eigenvector algorithm crashing, breaking down, being imprecise. So what we can do for cases where we've got short wide matrices, we can calculate x, x transpose, which is now an n by n matrix. Okay. And when I calculate that, the t's are scale, I get some, I can calculate the eigenvectors of x, x transpose. What I get back as my eigenvectors now are some scaled version of my scores. I don't get the scores exactly. Those I get back a set of vectors which are in the direction of my scores, but they've got they need to be multiplied to make them bigger or smaller. What I can go do though is I can say, well, okay, let me work with these scaled scores, calculate my p's, p is equal to x times t, rescale my loadings to unit length. Now I've got my loadings correct go back and calculate my scores again. It's easy to XP. Don't worry about these details. It's just more for those of you that, that might be interested in this. And in fact, we will come back to this later on in the course. Yeah. Uh, what do you do if you're missing data? You cannot use one step ahead <laughs> or two steps ahead. Disadvantages. Cannot handle missing data. Okay? If you've got missing data, you cannot use the eigenvector, eigenvalue process. Let's just uh, go back one slide. I just want to talk quickly about SVD. So SVD is um, 
a topic that may or not, may not be covered in undergraduate here at Mac, I'm not sure. Uh, it probably is covered in the graduate level course, and if you take the matrix course with Dr. Ryan. But SVD says, let me take my X matrix, not X transpose X, I'm taking my X matrix, and I decompose it into three other matrices, U, sigma, and V. U and V are orthonormal matrices, sigma is a diagonal matrix, and you can show that PCA, you can recover your PCA scores and loadings from the SVD by saying T is equal to U times sigma and P is equal to uh, V. Okay, so in MATLAB, again, another way to do it, let's say you've got an X matrix in MATLAB, so you've sent it and scaled or pre-processed your X matrix in some way, you can go in MATLAB and say <coughs> XV is equal to SVD of X. And then you can go say P is equal to V and T is equal to U times X. Okay. And then you'll get your, your scores and loads. Now for those of you that know a bit more about singular value decomposition, you know what this is saying is it's I'm what this is doing is it's taking your, your space, your X matrix, and you're going to project it onto another space or plug it as soon as it's all normal transformation. Then you're going to stretch or shrink it, and then you're going to re-scale or re-rotate it. So rotate, stretch, rotate. And if you look back at the original diagram, the geometric diagram that I showed for PCA, we're going, that is what it's doing. We're, we're taking our original data, projecting it, stretching it, and then projecting it again. So it makes intuitive sense, but I'm not going to go into those details because it doesn't really add too much more to our understanding of PCA. taking a column X times, so the diagonal entries are still the variances, your off diagonals are still covariances, uh, but it's the, your off diagonals now are your covariances of your rows with each other. But your diagonals are still your variances. Or are they? No, no, they're still, the, they're, sorry, they're right, you're, they're your variances with your rows. So, yeah, it's not your covariance matrix as such. Okay, this comes because we'll, we'll, I'll leave that, to, that explanation to another class when we come what are called kernel methods, where we calculate these small matrices n by n or k by k that are much smaller than the original data. And we do that, for example, when we're dealing with images or batch processes. It's more efficient to deal with these smaller matrices than the original data matrix. And then we'll, we'll go into the theory of the um, so the main disadvantages of, of using eigenvalues <coughs> and or SVD, I wouldn't recommend you ever do this, okay? Now, to be clear, there are some software packages on the market out there that will do PCA for you, and they use eigenvectors and eigenvalues. And the quickest way to discover that is put a missing value into your data set and the software screen. Ah, I can't do this. <laughs> okay, that's the very first thing there. Missing data cannot be handled by SVD or eigenvectors or eigenvalue processes, procedures from The other reason why I don't like to use that approach is because this, will, this approach will calculate all the eigenvectors for you. The maximum number of eigenvectors or, uh, or singular values and we don't ever need that. If you've got many columns K, we only need a few columns A, the first few components. We don't need all the components calculated. So they spend time calculating things we don't really ever use or look at. Behind the scenes, yes. So there's all of them. I don't know the techniques, but uh, there are various standard techniques for calculating eigenvalues. That's what we're going to look at next. Yeah, that's exactly what we're going to look at next, is the power element which approximates like that. Um, some other reasons why you, so this applies to both eigenvalues and SVD. 
this part here only applies to eigenvalues. So X transpose X can be difficult to calculate on a very large array. Um, you can get numerical overflow because you're, you're calculating squares and you're summing them up. You can often overflow the, the total storage uh, by, um, from your floating point storage on your computer. So for those of you that know that how data is stored on a computer, you can overflow numerically if you're dealing with a large data set. Um, and anyway, you always have to keep x around. Even though you might reduce the size of your um, x transpose x, you still need x available afterwards to go calculate t. Remember we said back here, after you've calculated your loadings for x transpose x, then you need to go multiply those loadings by x to get your scores. So you don't really save any memory or RAM in your computer by, by using the eigenvector approach. Um, so, so it negates that. Uh, Okay, but why, why did we go through these details? Well, it shows us what PCA is doing. All the properties of PCA are derived from the eigenvalue decomposition. So whenever someone in a journal article wants to prove something about PCA, they always say, assume no missing data. And then they go through the eigenvector approach. And that's great for proving certain theoretical properties. We'll do that in PLS as well when we come to PLS. Uh, but in practice, we know that we've got missing data we don't need all the components, and so we will use other methods to actually calculate the algorithm. But to prove certain things mathematically, the eigenvector approach is great. Um, and then I'll, I'll address this point in the next few slides. Okay, so now let's take a look at the details algorithm. This is the algorithm used by the software that uh, we're using in this course. It's also used by most good packages because it handles missing data. Now, there's really no need for me to go through this algorithm. If you understand the properties of PCA that we just looked at from eigenvalues, orthogonal components, the variances are decreasing from one component to the next, why bother looking at mean pals? The reason why I want you to look at mean pals is because I can guarantee you after this section, you will know what it means, why loadings move together. Why do two large loadings mean on, on, on a variable they mean that those two variables are correlated? You'll be able to understand again why the components are orthogonal. You'll see how missing data is handled. Um, and it is used by all software packages, so it's good to know what's going on. I think. And the other reason is you'll be able to quickly see here what happens if there's outliers in your data. Okay. With eigenvalues, if there's an outline my data set, I can't tell what's going to happen to the eigenvalue too much. But with this approach, after we've gone through that detail algorithm, you'll quickly realize if there's an outline my data set, what is it going to be? Okay, so this shouldn't be as painful as the previous section. <laughs> In fact, it should be far more enjoyable because all that Neepel's algorithm uses is the squares. In fact, the name comes from Nonlinear iterative partial least squares. So that indicates there's some sort of iterative procedure in here, as your father was asking earlier. The other acronym that I prefer to use is nonlinear iterative projections, because we're projecting to lower dimensional space using alternating least squares. We're going to alternate our least squares now. Okay, so we start with a, a bit of notation here that we have to have consistent. Let's start with x, pre-processed raw data. More correctly, let's call that x subscript zero to indicate we've not added, but uh, we've not extracted any components yet from x. And we'll follow this step. That is the Nikol's algorithm. Each one of these represents about a line of MATLAB code. So Nikol's algorithm, you should be able to write it in no more than 10 lines of MATLAB code. So you can pay $5,000 for a software package that will do PCA, but this is all that it's really doing. <laughs> okay, there's a lot more than that, but generally. Okay, so start as follows. Let's say I'm going to start with my first component, A is equal to 1. Select an arbitrary initial column for TA. That's my first step. In, then I go into a loop and I repeat this loop over and over until convergence. I will regress columns from X onto that TA. I'll then normalize the loadings that I get from that regression. 
I'll then do a second least squares where I regress rows from x onto p, and then I'll deviate. So let's take a look at each of those steps. Here's my x matrix, and I'm going to calculate the component, the eighth component. If I'm if the first component that x0, my, my pre-processed data, centered and scaled, and I'm going to calculate t1 and p1 from x0. Select an arbitrary initial column from x, or, so I can basically take any column from x, select that, and put that in as a ta. That's my starting guess for the first component. I can also take a column of random numbers. That will also work. So just use the random number generator for every row in ta, just put, put a random value. Anything works as long as it's not a column of zeros, okay? You'll see why in a minute. So usually what most algorithms do, they go across the X matrix and just pick any, any random column. Yeah. Oh, better, uh, I, I should clarify that. Any normally distributed random number with mean of zero and any variance, which is typically variance one. So in MATLAB, that would be the rand any function that will get you normally distributed. So pull any numbers from a random distribution as long. Basically, at the end here, don't have zeros, is what that's saying. Anything will do, as long as it's not zeros. Then we, we proceed as follows. We regress every column from x onto t. Now, let's introduce a little bit of terminology. When I say regress something onto something else, I'm saying regress a y onto an x. Let's come over here to this illustration. I've got my x variable and my y variable. Can you, is, is this purple color visible? Yeah. Regress an x onto a y. Each one of these orange crosses represents a data point. And I fit my regression through that, uh, through those points. And I can, as we've shown in, this, in the previous stats course, we've seen the equation x transpose x inverse x transpose y. For scalar x and for scalar y, that reduces down to x transpose y divided through by x transpose x. The reason why this works is if I've centered x and I've centered y, there is no intercept. Okay, we, I, those of you who have taken my stats course, that we, we prove that. If you take your x vector and your y vector and you center them, if you do calculate an intercept, it will be zero. So you don't have to calculate an intercept. You can just calculate the slope so that then afterwards you can write y at is equal to b times x. Okay, there's no intercept. And that b is given by x transpose y divided by x transpose x. No intercept. So we're going to do exactly the same thing here. When I say regress a y onto an x, here I'm saying regress a column from x onto ta. So let's talk, start with the first column. Take my first column, and I'm going to regress that onto ta. So this column here from this matrix, I'm going to put that in the position of my y. I'm going to put that as a y variable. So if I had to draw that on the board, I would say take column x1 as my y variable, Take those random numbers I just selected as TA and plot them. Let's plot those points and assume, let's say we can do something like that. That passes through the origin, through zero. That slope over here is B. That's my regression coefficient. And I take that regression coefficient slope, and I store that in that position of P. Okay. Go to my next column. My second column now, X2. Keep the same T1 vector, okay? And now let's say, plot those out, and we get something along those lines. And the best fit <coughs> regression slope looks like that. There's my regression slope, B, 
it's some number that's approximately zero, let's say, and I store that in a second element of the list. Through my third column, fourth column, here's the general the k column, and I go right up to the last column. So those regression coefficients, or those slopes from the regression, that's the entry here in the p vector, pKa, that's my regression coefficient, pKa is the slope, is equal to t a transpose times x k divided by t transpose t. That just comes from this. Okay. I'm just substituting in t is my x, x k is my y variable in this regression. So I'm regressing my column x onto that score t. That terminology you need to be very comfortable with it and these diagrams. We're going to use this all the time in this course. So let's just recap once more. I'm taking the kth column from x, and I'm regressing that onto my score, ta. So in other words, I'm treating this as my y variable, <coughs> and that is my x variable. Calculate the slope, the relationship between that x and y, and store that slope coefficient in that position in the Lillian vector. Come back to this slide um, in a minute and, and look at it, see the, the different interpretations. So I just proceed. K, I do k individual regressions. First column, second column, right up to the last column. Okay, in a loop. Or I can calculate all those regression coefficients in one go. Okay, I don't have to do it in a for loop. But algebraically, you can show that this term over here represents exactly the same as doing a k individual times. I just calculated a vector in one go. Denominator here is a scalar, t transpose t, the variance of t. Okay, if you're seeing this variance term come up again, t transpose x. And I just put the sizes of the vectors. There so, you can see. so if you're coding this up in MATLAB, you're really interested in this, and you want to go ahead and code up in MATLAB, these sizes of the vectors need to match up. By the end of this procedure now, I've calculated a vector p. So when I started the NEPALS algorithm, I had nothing yet in p. Okay, I had nothing. After this step 2.1, I have now a vector pa filled with values. Those values are the slopes between the individual columns of t. Now, we have this requirement, remember, from PCA that that's, that loading vector p1 must be of unit length. And it won't necessarily be of unit length after doing these regressions. So all I do is I normalize it. So I calculate the length of P, divide P through element by element. This is element by element division through P. Or another way of saying that is PA divided through by the norm of PA. Afterwards, if I calculate the norm of this PA over here on the left-hand side, it will have unit length. So this just simply rescales PA to have unit length. And in MATLAB, you can say something like P divided by the norm of P will get you the same result. Or you can write it out as this. It's exactly the same. So, in our while loop here now, we've done this first step. We've regressed columns from X onto T. We've normalized the logic to unit length. Now let's take a look at the last step in our, in our loop there. We go now and regress the rows from x onto that p. Let's take a look at that <laughs> diagrammatically. We're changing the roles around this time. We've just calculated <laughs> my x matrix. We've just calculated this loading vector p1 transpose. Now we're going to proceed as follows. <clears throat> Let's go to my first row from my x matrix. So x1 transpose. That's my first row from x. And I'm going to regress that row onto the loading. We always regress a y onto an x. So if I wanted to draw a little diagram here, what I'm saying is, 
here's P1 now. I'm regressing onto P1 as my x variable. My y variable in this regression is x1. Xi, I'll write this Xi if you want to make it explicit. I'm taking the first row from x. Okay, that is my y variable, that's my x variable. Maybe I just have, let's say I've got a data set with just five columns, like the data set you used in the assignment for today's class. K is equal to five, there's five elements in, in this loading vector. There's five elements, of course, in my row. And I just plot those five points. The best fit regression will always pass through zero. That slope then is now calculated by saying, using this formula over here, using the terminology, it's P transpose X divided by P transpose P. Okay, so P is my X variable, P transpose P is in the denominator, P transpose Y is in my numerator, but P transpose Xi is in my numerator. A little bit of a simplification, this denominator is equal to one obviously from the previous step, okay? But I don't want to write that on the board because we'll see in a minute why we don't. But in general, P transpose P will be equal to one. It's not one when we have missing data, but that's why I leave it like this. So I don't want you to just delete this and never use it. I keep that over there. Plus it also, whenever you see something in this form, you need to actually say, aha, I can see what's going on here. This is a regression. So it's great to leave it in this format. If I if I dropped off this denominator, you may not see that regression. Okay, so I'm regressing every row in X onto the loading vector P1. And then I store that corresponding regression slope in that position. Then I go to my next row, X2, do this same sort of thing, maybe this time I get I get something like this. Okay. I get a negative slope this time. And that value then gets stored into the second entry over here, x2. And I go all the way down until I do n such regressions. So there's n rows, n regressions, get to the bottom of that, and I've got a new score vector. By the end of this, I have overwritten or updated the values that were previously here in TA, or in the first component you want. I started with a set of values, I overwrite those now. Okay? So those, these numbers get changed. And that's where the loop starts over. I keep going through this loop, updating these values in T, updating the values in P. So I've just gone once through the loop, I come back to the top, <coughs> Go back up to step 2.1. Now I, re -re I regress my columns from x. These are the same numbers that were here before. x hasn't changed. t has changed. Okay. The second time I go through that loop, these values in the column t have are different numbers from the previous iteration through the loop. So no surprise in that the regression coefficients I store here in the loadings will get updated the second time through the loop. So second time through the loop, PA changes. Come back to step, uh, normalize them, again, step 2.2. So again, renormalize, step 2.3. Regress every row from X onto that new loading vector this time and store the correspond corresponding values and scores. Okay? So, you keep going through that loop over and over until this word convergence. We'll talk about that next. So I keep repeating this over and over until I converge. And we can guarantee, we don't prove it in this course, I'll let the people over there in the math department do it for me, they can prove that this algorithm will always converge. Guaranteed. We also kind of know that from the eigenvector, optimization problem, we show that we'll always get a global solution that's unique optimum. We, we have a hint that that will happen. This algorithm, let other mathematicians prove to you that it will converge, it's guaranteed to converge. All I want to talk about is how do we detect convergence. Okay? 
How would you detect conversions? Jay, if you were coding this in your lab tonight, which is so excited, how would you do it? I would compare it to the one that I had before and put this especially smaller. Okay, so let's, what you're saying is that to be like this, make it a little bit more precise when what is small. Uh, I guess. I guess like the T, but when the difference between the T that I got the last time and the T that I got this time. So let's call this iteration 105 and guess T from iteration 106. What would you say in, in that point? I would say if absolute value T105 minus T1106. Yeah. It's less than or equal to. Uh, I don't know, 1 times 10 to the minus 5, and stop. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, you could use uh, something like that. You could also, there's any number of ways you can do this. You can say T1 minus that, and then take the absolute value. Some people divide that through by, by that, just so that you don't, uh, uh, it's just a better condition number. And then what is this less than? A good thing to use is less than the square root of EPS, where EPS is the smallest floating point number that you can represent on your particular machine. And that mostly is 1.5 times 10 to the minus 8. Okay, so yeah, what you're saying would work fine. Uh, but in, this, is, this is probably a slightly better way of doing it, though you do get good, good answers with what you do with what you so we use the square root of EPS. We don't use numbers smaller than that because of a round of error in your computer. Um, what else is there to say? Oh, the other thing is, I could of course check convergence on the T's. I can also equally well check convergence on the P's. Because remember, both vectors are changing with every move. So T's converge, P's converge, the P's converge, T's converge. Back to this uh, convergence step, compare these, use that as one way to check. Also, uh, most practical implementations will also have a safety net, uh, so that if your number of iterations is greater than 200, some packages use 200, I use 500 and I in my software, um, because sometimes, we'll, I'll talk about it afterwards, you can get very slow convergence uh, in very special cases. But almost never will this safety net be triggered. You just need it then for practical purposes. Okay, we've converged. Let's assume we've converged. You can calculate now TA and PA. You just use the values from your last iteration through the loop, and those become your score and your loadings. Okay? Those scores and loadings, TA and PA, would be the same as the scores and loadings you calculate from eigenvector decomposition with slight round of error. Okay, because we've set our tolerance to be some small number, so it's expected that we're going to get some round of error. But for the most part, you should get good agreement up to about five or six decimal places with the eigenvector. So it's always a good way to check your Lipel's algorithm, is do the eigenvector on it and do your Lipel's algorithm and compare the two. Okay, so we finished step two. Now comes the step three, which Brandon had hinted at the start of the class. Let's deflate from x the part we've just calculated. Let's talk about what that means. So I'm going to deflate the x, x matrix. What that means is I'm going to remove the part from x matrix, the part that I can't explain. The part I can't explain is the components I've just calculated, TA, PA transpose. So the TAPA transpose, I haven't put this diagram in the notes, but it's, it's very helpful to visualize what this is. What's the size of the TA? Sorry? Mohammed, the size of the TA. The, this, how many? Well, how many elements in TA? By one, okay. PA transpose. One by K. Okay. So notice we're going from two column vectors and blowing up and creating a full matrix from this. 
Okay, so TA, PA says take the column vector TA, okay, multiplied by TA transpose. So that creates a new matrix X. I can't draw it the same size, but with N rows and K columns. Okay, where that first entry is the first entry is over there. You keep working your way through until you create, you fill out an entire matrix X. That is equal to <coughs> X hat. Okay, so X hat is equal to T A P A constant. X hat sub A. That says this is my prediction of X using A components, one, two, three, depending on where we are in this loop. And that's my okay, sorry, so that's my best prediction. And once I've got my prediction, I can calculate my residual. In other words, what where I'm going at with deflation, what deflation is trying to do here is to remove the part we can explain. The part we can explain is x hat. So we need to remove from x, and I'm using this notation a minus one, remove from that the part we can explain, and that leaves behind what we call e sub a. Uh, e sub a refers to the residuals after one component. Okay, so residuals after fitting the a component, I'll call e sub a. So I, I, I extract, the remove from x the part I can explain. <coughs> okay. Then what I go do is I'll set x a equal to e a, and repeat, go back to the start of my algorithm for the next component. The next component, the second component, let's say, does not work on the raw data after centering and scaling. It works on this modified matrix. In other words, it works on the residual matrix after the first component. So the second component will only start to explain variance on, on characteristics of the X matrix that have not been explained by T1 and T1. So that's what deflation is doing. And this notation then makes that clear. If XA is equal to EA, let's just go back to the first component and A is equal to 1. We set XA minus 1, that's the same as, as the, our pre process raw data. We go calculate the first component, calculate E1. E1 is then set equal to X1, which is you know, the residuals after the first component. And then I go do my second component on those residuals. I strongly recommend for those of you that have got any inclination in programming to go go code this up because you, it really makes it clear what, what the algorithm is doing. Um, now I want to take a look, I want to go back to the algorithm. I'm going to go right back to the beginning again. Let's go back into our algorithm. And I'm going to assume we're going to go through this loop the very last time. So we're just about to converge. We're just about to um, erase it, but that criteria that we had on convergence, we're just about to meet that criteria. What's going on when we do that last loop through the new phase algorithm? That's, that's good to see. It's a bit confusing trying to imagine what's going on on the very first loop where TA is just a column of random numbers. But on that very last round, TA that we're using here at the beginning of this, of this um, while loop is just about converged. So it's very close to the score values we're actually going to end up with. So let's go look at what's going on there. And this will help you interpret what, what the loadings mean. Okay, so I'm just going to redraw this diagram over here. Our X matrix centered and scaled. Our T1 that's pretty close to convergence. And now I'm saying I'm going to regress this first column from X onto T1. Let's think about this as the case study that, so that you use in the assignment. And let's assume X1 is equal to percentage order. We know from that assignment that the loading for the first component for oil was a large positive value. We know we're going to end up here with a large positive number. 
back to that first component for the first column. What does that mean? Well, let's take a look back. If we're addressing this first column onto T1, we're building a regression model with T1 as my x variable, and my column over here is x1, which is oil. Okay. So I take my oil, my oil vector, so there's my data for oil, here's my data for T1, I take these values and I draw a scatter plot. Fit the slope through that, and that slope is equal to P1 for the oil coefficient. That's equal to P11 for P oil for the first component. What does it mean if that's a large value or positive number? Large correlation. Large correlation between, between T1 and that oil vector. Okay, great. So a large positive value means strong relationship between this variable and the corresponding score. What if I have now density, which was column three, and I do the same thing here. It's my density. Okay. And so that slope is density. And basically it looks a bit the same. Maybe there's just a little bit more scatter, but similar shape into the, in, the, in that particular regression. Same interpretation. Density has a large uh, correlation with the T1 value. What does that say about the relationship then between x1 and x3? Strongly correlated as well. Okay. So loadings that have similar magnitude have cor are correlated, okay. which is a good way to read the loadings plot. So similar magnitudes on the loadings plot indicate similar correlations. x2 now, which looked if you did plot it, it would look negative. I guess it's more negative. Negative, right. So it will look something like that. So that's the slope for, for negatively correlated x2. x2, I forget, was uh, then, uh, no, it wasn't density, it was some other very crispiness, I think. Indicating that x x2 then, we'll say it was crispy, negatively correlated with that score. And then again, you can say x2 and x3, their relationship must be negative, x2 and x1's relationship must be negative as well. Okay? So that's the main reason why I want to go through the NEPAS algorithm. It makes it clear what the loadings are doing. Loading vectors similar in magnitude. In fact, if I had two loadings which had identically the same number, what would you say about those two variables? Perfectly correlated themselves. Because if I look back at this regression, T1 is not changing. T1 is the same variable again every time. So if, if x1 and x2 had exactly the same slope coefficient, it means x1 and x2 are exactly the same numbers. And you'll sometimes see that in data sets. You get two data points in your, in your loadings plot right on top of each other. You can immediately tell those two variables are, are just maybe they scale values of each other or they're exactly the same value of each other. Okay, so that's the interpretation of this regression. Let's take a look at the interpretation of the row regression. So I've got my, I've got my uh, loading vector calculated now. This is on my last iteration through, so the loadings are not going to change after this. And now I regress a particular row from x. So x, I transpose. I regress that row onto that loading. And coming back to this page three case study, I've got a much smaller number this time in that k direction. 
That's PY transpose. Let's say this is XI particular row. There's only five values. Regression coefficient represents the score. That slope represents the score value of that. What would you say then for a observation, a row from X, where that score value is large negative? Oh, sorry, positive in this case. This one's a bit harder to interpret. That, uh, the low, that uh, the low being explains the best variance of all the variables. Kind of thing. That's, yeah, that's close. Uh, which I, I, I can see where you're going. This regression coefficient, t, the value I'm going to ultimately store here, represents the strength or the magnitude of that relationship between the loading and that particular row. So let's say, coming back to this data set that we looked at today, the first element was a large positive, then a negative, then a positive, then a negative, and then a number that was roughly zero. Okay. If I have a row here, which is also a positive, a negative, a positive, a negative, and then it doesn't matter what goes there, do you? What is the relationship between x and p? Well, it's going to be something like this. There's my large positive x and my large positive p. There's my other large positive x and my other positive p. Let's shift this data point to here to zero. That's my last column. There's my, let's move it over there. There's my negative p and my negative x, my other negative p and my other negative x. So each one of those dots represents point. So it rows then that match the pattern of that loading vector P1 will get a large score. Okay, so rows that have a high correlation with the loadings will get a large score. If I had another row where it had the inverted pattern, so a negative value there, positive, a negative, a positive, and zero, that regression slope would be the same there, except negative this time, showing that this is going to give me a negative T1 value. Similarly, if I had an observation P1 and then this now observation is Xi, where the numbers are roughly like that, and my best fit slope is that. It says there's no relationship between that observation and that loading. That observation is not described by this loading vector. There's no correlation. It's going to get a zero value here. Okay. A number that's roughly zero in that score. I, I didn't say that, but the same applies, of course, with, um, with the column regressions. If I go back to my column regressions, if I have column xk that really has no relationship with that score, for example, the hardness variable in the first component had a very small loading. That's because the relationship between hardness in that column and T1 was roughly zero. There was no scatter plot relationship. If I had to draw the data, I'd see a very small relationship. Low R squared, very small relationship. And so therefore the corresponding loading is zero. If you get these two plots and these regressions, you've understood PCA. Okay, <laughs> so I know a few of you are still confused. You're kind of getting it. You're starting to see it. it I didn't get it on the first round through either. Um, I strongly recommend you go through these and think of the different cases. Large positive relationship, large negative. In fact, I, will, I, I won't send it as an assignment, but I will put it up on the website where I'll ask you to go through a few cases from that uh, food texture the pastry data set. And you can plot these regressions yourself and take them. Yeah. So sorry, I'm just trying to understand the iterations a little bit now. Overall, as we're going along, at least for that last, like going back, should the slopes be like getting more dramatic? Like because that would represent more uh, the slopes will eventually stronger stabilize, right? Yeah. As you go through the iterations you're converging and things are not changing. It's just 
We're trying to get the largest variance T. Okay, right. If you want to look at it that way, rather look at the eigenvector decomposition. Okay. Think of this, I, I'm going to prove to you in a minute that this is, okay, we're going to calculate the eigenvectors for you, so that's the correct interpretation, but don't see it as trying to, the algorithm is not setting out to do that. Certainly we've never mentioned it here in the objective function, right? The, the objective of this, and, yeah. Okay, so, it takes a while to get it, but once you've got it, you'll, you'll definitely be so, so glad because this understand this will help you understand how to read the loadings plot on PCA and, and the score plot. Um, so we've looked at these cases. What will the regression look like or a strong relationship or weak relationship? And really the meaning of what the loadings are should become apparent to you now. Um, I'll, I'll leave this viewpoint out for now, I think that's probably too confusing to look at because think of, for those of you that might want to do this on your own, we've built regressions here and we've looked at the best fit slope, but it, when we do a regression, we don't just get a slope, we also get a, a, a y hat predicted, or y predicted. So those predicted actually mean something. And to go back to those regressions and look at what the predictions might mean, I won't cover that in, in today's class, it's a bit, a bit too much. Okay, one other. Uh, step to show here just to satisfy Brandon's curiosity. After convergence, let's say we've converged, we've got our TA vector, we've got our PA vector. <laughs> From the Nepal's algorithm, go back to step 2.3, 2.1, sorry. At convergence, I've got this following <laughs> equation. Uh, P1 transpose is equal to T1s divided by T1 transpose T1. Okay. I also have from step 2.3 that T1 is equal to X times P divided by P transpose P. If I substitute one equation into the other, so I take my step 2.1, that's this, this equation over here. I can also write this equation. I'm going to do a bit of magic here on the board, take a look carefully. P1 transpose, transpose is equal to T1 transpose X. Take that transpose away, flip that around. It's exactly the same thing, just transposing the entire equation. So that's what I've gone and done. I'm going to go from here. So here I've done two things. I've dropped the A subscripts, they're just getting out of the way. I'm just transposing the entire equation. So this equation is from uh, <coughs> step 2.1, same as that. Step 2.3 is this over here. Note that P transpose P is equal to 1. Substitute this equation in over here for T. And you can show then that you get this relationship over there. Rearrange that, and you just get back to your eigenvector form. Okay? So that kind of brings us full circle. An EPELS algorithm really is just calculating the eigenvectors and eigenvalues for you, is another way of interpreting, interpreting that result. Okay, and the eigenvector will be P, the eigenvalue is lambda, which is T transpose T, if you know T words. Okay, so that's a that's a, a very uh, broad overview of what the Nikos algorithm is doing. I would strongly recommend, like I said, that you go close it up just to see some of the details a bit more. Some other things I just want to quickly mention here, yeah, just one, one more thing and then we'll call it, call it a day. Uh, convergence is very fast if the, algorithm, if the eigenvalues are well separated. Uh, you had asked, again, about uh, what will happen if you get two eigenvectors that are eigenvalues that are the same magnitude. What will happen, I can just illustrate it for you quickly. PCA is basically going around finding this greatest direction of variance. If you have two vectors that have similar, like so component, let's say component three and component four, that have similar eigenvalues, this is the only case where you get very slow convergence. So let's say Component 3 is roughly equal to component 4, with a small numerical rundle. What happens is, 
PCA goes around spinning in a circle trying to find this direction of greatest variance, but it doesn't find one because all directions to it look equally great. <laughs> so it just keeps going and going, and that's why I had that safety net. Like, stop when you get to 300 iterations. Because what's happened by the time you get to that point, this thing has gone around looking for this direction of greatest variance. You can pick any direction and set it equal to it. Any direction will do. Like, all these directions are equally great variance. Then the very next iteration for lambda 4 will converge within a few iterations, three or four. Because immediately it just sets it orthogonal to that, and it's done. Okay? So that's it. It very seldom happens, but just so that you understand. Um, last thing I want to look at is how does PCA, how is missing data handled? Very, very simply. If I have, in fact, this is so stupidly simple that it's amazing that people don't use EPUB's algorithm. I'm, su I'm surprised when software packages use eigenvectors because it's really trivial to handle missing data. Come back to the case where we're regressing x onto t. So we'll never have missing values. Let's just deal with t1. We'll, we'll never have missing values in t1, right? Because I can just choose those to be random numbers. Any non-zero values, I just plug them into there. Never have missing data there. Let's say I've got a column here from x. And I have two or three missing values. I don't have that value, I don't have that value, and I don't have that value. Okay? Yeah. I can still use the remaining values in that column and do my regression. So there, let's say the white points represent, if I did have those values, let's say, they, they would have landed there. But I don't have them now. I can still fit that slope, there. and that slope is going to be very close to the slope I would have calculated if I did have these values. Then you're free, you're on your way. You just calculate the slope, store that slope as your loadings, and keep iterating. So missing data is trivial to handle. Okay? You just still fit regressions. There's nothing to it. Okay? If you want to read a bit more, uh, paper 68 and paper 20 on the on the database, on the literature database will give you Many other alternatives for fitting this again. This one I just described is called um, <coughs> SCP, single component projection. But these other papers show other alternatives. Yeah. No, if you've got numbers in there which are outliers. <laughs> No, no algorithm so if you put garbage in, you're going to get garbage out. Yeah. Nothing's going to be taken for you except yourself. And the um, okay, so let's wrap up, wrap up the wrap up the class with um, with this quick discussion. So we've got ten minutes left. I know you're just dying to go eat. Let's quickly just talk about outliers. What will happen if I take Let's just come back to this matrix so we get to it. And now, let, let me say that orange point over there is not missing value. Let's say that that point is an outlier. It's a number that's just, let's say, plus 10. So all these other numbers we know on the first iteration through the column, those numbers are all between plus and minus 2 or 3. Let's say that number is plus 10. What's going to happen? when you calculate your regressions. It's gonna, this point is gonna bias that slope, okay? Let's say you had a really bad case where this is T1, and here's that column from X. <coughs> Let's say, <coughs> This was the relationship between xk and t1. And over here is that outlier. What's the regression slope? Plus it towards first. Plus is zero. Okay, so it's going to store as my loading here. 
positive coefficient. But the real relationship between that column and T1 is actually something negative. If I go exclude that outlier and I reflip my PCA model, now my data is going to go like that, and I'm going to get the correct or expected coefficient then in the moment. Okay, so you can see how outliers will just they'll just screw up these regressions for you. Um, but we'll see then in next class how that will actually show up in the data set uh, in SPE. Okay. But it's it's a good a good way to understand what outliers do. So what I'll, I'll leave you to do is, you can go through this, we've covered all of these points. The only other thing that's maybe worth mentioning here is that actually this is the algorithm used by Google to, for their search index. Maybe not now, they published this root paper in 2005. Google's original page rank algorithm is nothing more than singular value decomposition in a very special X matrix. And that, you can imagine the size of that X matrix. <laughs> They're not doing SVD or eigenvalue in that element. They're using Google's algorithm. They may not say it, they call it the power algorithm, but if you go read that paper over there, it's very clear that it's just an ethos algorithm. Okay? Flipping signs, I'll leave that for you to read. And then next class, we'll, we'll take up this problem. Um, I know that maybe some of you had read that paper by Swanty Wall in cross validation. We didn't get to cross validation today's class. We'll pick up from this point the next time and